Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Good morning, welcome. Thank you for attending our summit. I am the MC, I'm Lysandra Noyle. Um, we will have welcome remarks from Dr. Roga L. So, so, I can't express, I don't wanna mess up her last name. From Dr. Rogla. Good morning. My name is Dr. Rula El Siraj, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event titled How Community Solutions Can Reduce Infant Mortality in Houston. I have the honor of serving as the director of the Center for Health and Biosciences, the CHB, here at the Baker Institute for Public Policy. The CHB serves as a nonpartisan public policy institute that provides fact based policy analysis and solutions to some of our greatest public health challenges locally, nationally, and globally, in order to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. Affiliated with Rice University and adjacent to the Texas Medical Center, we are exceptionally equipped to bridge the gaps between science and policy and serve as a platform for collaboration among scientists, community organizations, and policymakers. Our purpose today is to address a critical public health challenge elevated infant mortality rates in Houston and the United States and associated social disparities. Currently in the United States, the average infant mortality rate, meaning the number of infants who die before the age of one, is 5.4%. This is higher than other high-income countries. Furthermore, major disparities in infant mortality rates by race and ethnicity exist. The Healthy People 2030 goal set by the Department of Health and Human Services is to reduce infant mortality down to 5% by the year 2030. Addressing the impact of social determinants of health on infant mortality is critical in reducing such disparities. I am a physician with Baylor College of Medicine who has served as a woman's health expert at the VA hospital for over 17 years. And I firmly believe that the reproductive health of women is critical not just to the overall wellness of women, but also to our society as a whole. Women in the state of Texas, in particular women of color, struggle to access health care and face significant socioeconomic barriers that contribute significantly to infant mortality and maternal mortality rates in Texas. Therefore, it is imperative that we focus on such social determinants of health in order to improve the lives of women and infants in Texas and ultimately our society as a whole. Today, we are most focused on how we can work together to reduce the drastic racial and ethnic disparities in infant mortality. As you will hear from Dr. Sampson, the numbers are staggering right here in our own community. I believe 
that the Baker Institute can serve as an instrumental platform for collaboration in the Houston area, where we can bring together members of our community invested in reducing infant mortality to strengthen our purpose and impact. This includes researchers and healthcare providers in our community whose work directly impacts infant mortality rates. Beyond this, the translation and the analysis of their data and work into meaningful and effective public policy recommendations is essential in ensuring lasting changes in our society. So today is all about collaboration, building bridges, and educating one another. Again, we are thrilled to host you today and hope that you leave here today with more knowledge, enthusiasm, and opportunities for engagement to resolve this very critical public health issue of increased mortality rates in Houston and the United States. Thank you very much. And again, good morning. I am Lysandra Knoll. I serve as the program director, oh, they're gonna, the program director for the University of Houston Healthy Start program, who is supported by the Bahursa Health Resource and Service Administration. This site has been serving the community since 2019. We have served over 800 families and counting. The Healthy Start is aware that is aware that the health of a baby is determined long before a woman is even pregnant. Therefore, Houston Healthy Start has coordinated care case managers, a registered nurse, doulas, and mental health providers to provide individualized services to both men and women. I would like to introduce our passionate team that stand in the community and support our families day in and day out. Will the Healthy Start team please stand? I want to acknowledge you for all that you do and thank you for your impressive work that you do. Please, you guys can be seated. Please, <laughs> please follow uh, Healthy Start on our any social media platforms, Instagram um, at Healthy Start UH and our Facebook, Healthy Start UH. Again, welcome to our Community Solutions Summit. We aim to reduce infant mortality um, in the Houston area. Infant mortality is described as a baby not making it past their first year of, their first year of life. Houston, is, Houston Healthy Start is one of the 101 nationally known sites. We aim to improve the health during pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, uh, and postpartum for moms, fathers, and the babies, most at risk for infant mortality and maternal mortality. Houston Health, Healthy Start, we, elevate, we uh, elevate the health of the pregnant and postpartum moms. Our team, again, works in the community. Now, every September, it's National, uh, National Infant Mortality Awareness Month, sponsored by, excuse me, National Healthy Start Association. And October 15 is also known as Nash, the uh, Remembrance Day, is known for um, national pregnancy and infant loss. That includes miscarriages, stillborns, SIDS, um, and any in any termination of uh, for a pregnancy for medical reasons. Now, during this these months, September and October, people are encouraged to be educated and be more aware of how they can help and ensure that babies take their first step in life. The purpose of this summit today is to bring awareness, to educate, and for you all to take action. Please join us as we take the next steps to ensure more babies can celebrate their first birthday. And next we will have, we have um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Um, she is, will be visiting us virtual, in a virtual space. She's in DC taking care of business. And so um, she should be coming up in just a second. Good morning. I'm so excited to be at the University of Houston Graduate School of Social Work Healthy Start program. You have a great team. This is a great program. And I really wish I could be with you in person. But I hope as you begin this morning, you will know my commitment to this unbelievably devastating condition for our infant babies. And although I'm in Washington, I'm gonna to continue to work with you in Houston and also amplify and reaffirm the importance of the federal uh, and local partnership dealing with infant mortality. Infant mortality is an issue that I've been passionate about solving for years as it affects mothers and families around the world, Houston, Texas, and the United States of America. 
Houston and Harris County are no exceptions to this widespread problem. You are doing the right thing. According to Harris County Public Health, from 2016 to 2020, the infant mortality rate in Harris County was 5.82 to 6.32 deaths per 1,000 live births. That is too many. Precinct 1, which is predominantly communities of color, had the highest maternal mortality rate at 5.68 deaths per 10,000 live births. We have to find a solution. Specifically, black infants under one year of age had the highest mortality rate between 2016 to 2020, which were more than double the rate of other racial and ethnic groups, but their problems among all racial and ethnic groups. Compared to Texas as a whole, in 2021, Harris County had a child mortality rate of 55.3 per 100,000, as compared with Texas state rate of 51.3 per 100,000. In 2018 and 2019, Texas had an infant mortality rate of 5.5 deaths per 1,000 live births. Families and communities, especially those of color, are suffering, and I'm determined to work with you in this Healthy Start program to assist them as best we all can. I believe the federal partnership with HHS is crucial to the work you're doing, and I commit to continue to working with you on the question of extinguishing child infant mortality. One effort that I'm delighted to see in effect is the University of Houston's Healthy Start program. In actuality, that program started in Vermont under my classmate, Governor Dean, when he was governor of the state of Vermont. He began a program of visiting the homes of mothers prenatal and then through birth and then after. We developed that program by looking at his model, and here we are the Healthy Start program. It takes just one idea. is a national program now that helps improve the lives of mothers, infants, and families before, during, and beyond pregnancy. It is crucial in this conference today that you learn how to expand the program, build a footprint, and build more federal funding in our partnerships so you can do more and have more clients. Clients referred to U of H Healthy Start will receive in-home case management services and will be navigated through healthcare and community resources based on eligibility and need. This is especially important because black mothers are more at risk and many other mothers fit in this category as well. Some services that Healthy Start program provides are home visits, absolutely necessary. Doula services, absolutely necessary. And nurse visits in high risk communities. These save lives. They save the lives of mothers, they save the lives of the infants, and more importantly, they save the physical and mental wholeness of this new family, giving this baby a wonderful head start. That's why I'm so excited about this program and want it to expand and want this city to be the leader in this program with the University of Houston Graduate School of Social Work. So far from 2020 to 2022, Healthy Start has had 107 babies born to their program. Mothers receive their service during pregnancy, and the babies have had a 11.2% preterm birth rate, lower than the rates of 12.3% of Harris County and 14.26% at the national level. That means they've come to term healthy, being loved, fullness in both their mental, young mental state, their infant mental state, and their physical state. I cannot wait to see the Healthy Starts program continued outcomes, and I urge others in our community and the nation to support programs like this one. I will be supporting them. I am a member of the Maternal Health Caucus. I've advocated for legislation dealing with bringing down the maternal mortality rate as well as infant mortality, and we're going to be the victors. We're going to be victorious. I cannot emphasize how important it is that we bring awareness to infant and mental and maternal mortality. This issue affects us all, and we must stay committed to supporting our most vulnerable communities. I'm excited about working with you. Congratulations to the School of Social Work. I hope this will be a wonderful conference. As you well know, as I look forward to the great things in this city, I will look to this special program to expand it as fast and as far as we can with our federal partners because we want to save lives and we want to give our babies, our children, our infants the best start in life they could. Congratulations, and have a wonderful, wonderful conference. Um, we also have a representative from Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee's office. 
Mr. Den uh, Dennis Little John, would you please come? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Dennis Littlejohn with Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee's office. Now, I won't come up here and talk because the Congresswoman has already done that, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I am here today to um, present congressional certificates of congressional recognition on behalf of the Congresswoman. As she says, she cannot make it as she's in D.C. Um, the House is back in session. But I would like to recognize um, the University of Houston Healthy Start Program, Graduate College of Social Work, on the occasion of the Healthy Start panel discussion on infant mortality. Now therefore be resolved that on behalf of the constituents of the 18th Congressional District of Texas, I take great pride in recognizing the University of Houston Healthy Start Program on the occasion of the Healthy Start panel discussion on infant mortality. This panel discussion focuses on educating Houston and the greater Houston area on infant mortality and its occurrence in Harris County, Texas. Your commitment to Harris County and the families in Houston, Texas reflects the spirit and the pride that exemplifies the United States of America. Indeed, your dedication and efforts are most deserving of the respect, admiration, and commendation of the United States Congress. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you. Um, and if you don't mind, I would love to take pictures with um, the Healthy Start program. If there's a representative, I believe that would be you. Um, and then Baker Institute Center for Health and Biosciences. Um, and then Dr. I don't want to butcher any names, but Dr. Rola uh, Elsar. Okay. Okay. There you go. And Dr. Logan, Dr. Rochelle Logan. And Dr. McLean Sampson, Dr. Sampson, yeah. <laughs> and lastly, but not least, Dr. Felicia York. Thank you. I do apologize, I did not let you guys know where the bathrooms were. For those who don't know, the ladies' bathroom is this way, and the gentlemen's bathroom is this way. Next, we'll have a presentation with Dr. McLean Sampson, Infant Mortality Crisis. Welcome. Good morning. Are y'all the students from Clear Lake? Yeah. Channel View. Channel View, excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Are y'all all, all in one program of study? Yes. Well, uh, world of research class and then some students. Excellent. I'm so glad. And thank you to everyone in the audience. In this room, I'm so excited to see people who are passionate about moms and babies. Um, you know, mother and baby health is often the metric for societal health, and many of you in this room know that we are actually getting very low grades on our report card as a country for maternal and infant health. So anytime we get a chance to talk to captive audiences, we really encourage you to keep doing the work that you do to shift the value that we place on moms and babies in this country, because that is the way change is going to happen. So my name is McLean Sampson, and I actually uh, represent both University of Houston and this beautiful building, the Baker Institute for Public Policy. 
So through University of Houston, that's where we are delivering the Healthy Start program that you will continue to hear about today. It is a direct services program that provides home visits and community education, and we try to make impact on a public policy level. So that's the work that I do over at Baker, is we continue to try to elevate the work that is being done by Healthy Start. There are other sites in Texas, and we're working together as an alliance to try to make a change statewide, not just at a local level. Okay. I also want to say I am notorious for having typos in my slides. Um, I don't know what it is. I have to read it about four times before I see typos. So I'm just going to own that <laughs> for anybody that is noticing. But I will deliver correct information as I talk. So don't worry. So why are we here today? As I just said, without healthy babies and healthy moms, you really can't have a healthy society. Um, I often talk about maternal health and the crisis of maternal mortality, especially among black women. And as you know, moms and babies are connected. So we also have a crisis with infant mortality, especially among babies who are black. So today I'm hoping to frame the, the situation for you and give you an idea of how we can make a difference at the local level. Because I know for me, when I just hear all of these statistics, it can feel very overwhelming. Oh, good. Okay. So one way that you can feel like you're making a difference is really to start having a health equity focus. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. I also want you to think about health. We tend to think about health as, I'm going to set my timer too. I'm sorry. Okay. We tend to think about health as an exercise or diet or maybe even health care. We think of it as like an action, right? Yet health is multifaceted, and it's really important that you know that about 30 to 55% of our health outcomes are actually affected by social and non-medical drivers of health. It's not just about your health care. It's not just about insurance. It's about where we live, eat, work, pray, play. And I'm hoping that you'll come away with um, an understanding of that today. So, okay. This is a slide that I took a few years ago uh, from the CDC site, and I like it just because of its simplicity to help us get in the right uh, framework and lens when we're hearing this information. So health equity is when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And the best way to do that is to eliminate barriers to health. We have infrastructures that actually drive our health in this country and in every country, really. But I want you all today to be thinking about this infrastructure of programs. Healthy Start is a program itself, right? And luckily, the people who wrote Healthy Start and continue to authorize it, um, like Congresswoman Lee was saying, it was built with a very health equity focus. And I say that because we make a change by doing interpersonal interactions with the home visits. Then we're out in the community trying to educate the fathers and family members um, any other residents, neighborhoods, we're really trying to elevate health at a community level. And then the third goal of Healthy Start is to make public impact by trying to make policy change. So we spent a lot of time this year advocating for the expansion and extension of Medicaid. We're very excited that the legislature has approved Medicaid in this state to be expanded to 12 months as opposed to 60 days. It's also comprised of measures. You've got to think about how data is collected. Who's, who's creating what data is collected and how is it being collected? For a long time, when we were looking at maternal and infant health, we were looking at the general stats, like everybody put together, what is the rate? And even though at a, at a um, I'm sorry, at a country level, it appears that infant mortality has reduced quite a bit. When you pull apart that data and you look at it across race and ethnicity, you see that for some groups, it's staggeringly high. And so if we aren't looking at data on a pulled apart way, like by age, neighborhood, race, ethnicity, it can really form an opinion that things are okay. And they're, they're not okay. So we'll be showing you that today. 
Also, policies inform health, and we really need to work towards laws, regulations, and rules that are focused about improving the health of the population, not just a clinical one-on-one -on -one interaction. So to define it, infant mortality is the death of an infant before their first birthday and measured by 1,000 lives. So as a show of hands, how many people in here are a parent? Right, so just imagine that one loss is too many. So as we go talk about these numbers, um, I really like this quote that says, more than a statistic, it reflects a tragic moment in a family's life. And in some instances, the failings of the social and healthcare institutions of a community. As of 2020, the United States continues to have one of the highest infant mortality rates. So in the entire country, looking at everybody and averaging it out, we have a 5.58 out of 1,000. Um, that's notably higher than other developed countries. The leading causes of infant mortality include birth defects, preterm birth, low birth weight, complications with maternal pregnancy, sudden infant death syndrome, and other injuries. So how is our health equity when it comes to infant health in the United States? This chart right here, oh, it matches this. I hope you can see the differences. <laughs> I'll tell it to you. Um, in fact, I have these numbers written down because of that. Okay, so on this slide, what you can see is these are deaths of infants before their first birthday, and this is just from 2020 to 2021 in a highly industrialized country, right, where we have the world's best health care. You can see that on this far left side, it, um, this is white um, population. Dark green is 2020, light green is 2021. So there were 4.4 deaths out of 1,000 in 2020 and 4.36. So it actually went down a little bit for infants that are white. Next to it, you see black non-Hispanic. The rate is more than double, 10.38 in 2020, 10.5 in 2021. So that's going up. American Indian and Alaska Natives, 7.6 in 2020, 7.46 in 2021. The next uh, lower one is Asian non-Hispanic at 3.14, 3.69. So that group is doing better, as you can see, and they're actually doing better than if we're just looking at white. And then Pacific Islander non-Hispanic is the next to the last, and that should say 7.17 and 7.76. So you can see that their rates are also very high. And then for Hispanic living in the US, 4.69 to 4.79. Um, this group of people, Hispanics, also had um, really big impacts from COVID. So I think we're, we're sadly going to see some continued trending up for Hispanic population and infant mortality. So when you look at this, does this look equitable? No, it looks vastly inequitable, right? When we've got 13% of the population, um, black non-Hispanic with these kind of rates that are twice as high for infant mortality, up to three times as high for maternal mortality, that is a public health crisis and it needs attention. So using our lens of health equity, I would like everybody to consider that not only do we have a problem with infant mortality, but specifically we have stark racial disparities in infant and maternal health. And if we don't focus on reducing disparities, we're really not going to get at the problem. What, we, what they predict will happen is that the groups that are doing well will continue to do better. The groups that are doing poorly will continue to do worse, right? So that's why it's so important to have a focus on reducing the inequities. This is despite living in a highly industrialized country. We spend 18% of our gross domestic product on healthcare, $4.3 trillion going towards healthcare annually. So we should be asking, how are the programs, how are our measures, and how are policies being used to achieve infant health equity? I wanted to give you an example of how policy can be used since we are at the School of Public Policy. 
well, it's not a school, it's a think tank, um, but we are talking about policy can make a difference. We really need to have the interpersonal interaction with amazing people like our team who do home visits, and we need to have policy advocates pushing for change. Because a study that compared the infant mortality rate for states that had Medicaid expansion to the states that have non-Medicaid expansion, do we have, non do we have Medicaid expansion in Texas? No, we do not. We continue to deny it, and luckily we did get it extended for 12 months, but there are still millions who are not enrolled in Medicaid. So there is a difference between expansion and extension. So anyway, when comparing states that did expand Medicaid and states that did not expand Medicaid, you can see that the infant mortality rates went down in the states where they expanded Medicaid because more mothers were on Medicaid during pregnancy and postpartum, and it makes a difference. As of 2019, just a couple years ago, nearly 20% of the Hispanic population and 11% of the black population in the US were uninsured. More than 90% of those who do not have health care coverage are a result of residing in non-Medicaid expansion states, which mostly consist of southern states that have a high black population. So that also drives the disparity, right? Okay, so I also wanted to provide a little bit of information about what are these non-medical drivers. So when we say medical drivers, there are things that are going on physiologically in our body, right? We might be predisposed, whatever, you know what I mean. Thank you. Um, to having high blood pressure during pregnancy, but also the environment that we're living in. Not only our home environment, but picture when you had a baby or your partner had a baby in the environment that you were in. Was it rushed? Was it hectic? Were you being listened to? Or was it warm? Was it inviting? Did you feel you had a voice, right? All of these things are affecting what's going on in our body and affecting our health outcomes. So for example, income and social protection, that kind of means social status, uh, education, unemployment, job insecurity, what are your working life conditions? What about food security? Do you and your family have access to nutritious and high quality foods? What about housing? Major crisis in this country, right? And at a local level. Early childhood development, social inclusion and non-discrimination, structural conflict, access to affordable health services. So when you see this whole constellation of other factors affecting health, you can see how important eliminating barriers are to have optimal health. I also want to point out that this is something that is less often talked about in, in settings like this, like in academia. Um, think tanks do, do a little better job of talking about this outright, but we have to look at structural determinants of health. When you have an entire group of people, especially people who are uh, you know, living the legacy of slavery and historically affected by discrimination, and their rates are so much higher with negative health outcomes, you have to scratch the surface, right? So structural determinants must be examined and overturned. And Dr. Kamara Jones, who's the former president of the American Public Health Association, had a great article that's gotten a lot of recognition where she recognizes racism-related stressors among BIPOC mothers. She talks about three levels of racism, and these are really important to know because we have such a hard time talking about racism and its effects in this country, right? But we often get hung up on interpersonal racism, which is, or I'm sorry, that's the second one. The first one I want to talk about is internal. Um, you may have heard that, internalized racism. It's really where you believe all the, the conditioning and messages that you've been told that essentially you're not a valuable member of society. Your health doesn't matter um, because of your race. That's internalized racism. But the personal mediated is the one we really talk a lot about and get really stuck on and really stops conversations because people get defensive, right? This is personally mediated. These are assumptions and actions by others. It's when you're in your birthing area and somebody is outright treating you less than, discriminating, that's the personal mediated. 
But this other one, institutional, has to be looked at if we're going to turn the tide on maternal and infant mortality. And institutional structural barriers are when there's different access, different access to health care and a healthy environment. So our national knowledge really informs our local level focus. In Harris County, we have a higher infant mortality rate than we do in the state of Texas. And here we have the largest medical center, right? And we have a phenomenal safety net with Harris Health. But we also have a very large population and we have a lot of uninsured populations and we have a huge amount of ground to cover when you want to drive somewhere. So anyway, the infant mortality rate in Harris County, 6.32 among the general population. In the zip codes we serve, we, we work with zip codes that have at least one and a half times the national average of infant mortality. Our average zip code, when we looked at our zip codes, or I'm sorry, our average infant mortality rate across all of our zip codes, 10, 10.3 deaths per 1,000 births. The infant mortality rate for black infants in Harris County is almost twice as high as the general population with 11 deaths per 1,000. So Healthy Start works to reduce these numbers by investing in the mom's health. We try to work with moms as soon as they are pregnant, um, but we also accept moms when they are 38 weeks pregnant. We say, come on in. We try to assign them a doula if they want a doula. We assign them um, mental health services if they would like to do that. We actually have one of our mental health providers is here. So we're a really lovely integrated program where we try to cultivate trust so that people will take advantage of the services to be healthy. We serve women through pregnancy up to 18 months postpartum, their babies and their fathers. We have our uh, fatherhood practitioner here. He's the one wearing lavender at our table of staff. <laughs> um, so just so y'all know the demographics, we have about 67% of our clients served self-identify as non-Hispanic black, 18% identify as Hispanic. So we really are focusing on reducing racial disparities. You'll also see on your table, and if you don't have it on your table, there are some out front, this uh, one pager that we created. So you can have some quick data to look at Healthy Start. And when the Congresswoman Lee was talking, she was reading some statistics from the one pager we gave her back in January. So this one actually has a little bit different numbers because it's the most up-to-date Give us a big wave win for always doing our data. She's a fantastic graduate student that helps pull together the data. So <clears throat> preterm birth, as you know, is one of the causes of infant mortality. And it is defined as 36 weeks uh, delivery. So if you're delivering before 37 weeks out of 40, that's considered preterm. My daughter was born preterm, but she was 36 weeks, and it was okay. She wasn't perfect, but it was okay. That's at 36 weeks. So imagine when babies are born at like 22, 23 weeks. I wanted to show y'all over here that when we took a look at our data, the UH Healthy Start across all of our 10 zip codes, our preterm birth rate right now is at 10.3, which is lower than the Harris County average at 12.6. So thank you to our workers who work so hard to take care of your families. You are making a difference. Thank you. For infant mortality, we have had one infant death in four years. And this rate that you see here, 5.34, is actually the statewide rate. So we obviously are lower than the state. And then remember that Harris County is around 6.3. And the sources are here on the last slide if anybody needs the sources. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Look at this. Oh, I'm still on a mic. I wanted to just point out real quick um, that the child fatality review team, there's one in every state. And they did a recent report, a decade in review report. And for Harris County, the number one leading cause of death for the age group we work with, 18 months and under, is sleep-related deaths. I mean, it's 78%. So it's sleep-related. And then I think the second um, next to that is physical abuse 
and also accidents that happen in, in the car. So we'll be talking a little bit more specifically about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. Our second presentation will, will be done by, okay, Dr. <laughs> I'm like, where'd she go? <laughs> Dr. Felicia York, welcome. Good morning. So, okay, this I just pressed this going forward, right? That's easy. Okay. So, good morning. I am Dr. Felicia York. Um, I know the information here says that I am still a postdoc at the University of Houston, but on Monday I started a new position at the Texas A&M University. Whoop! So I am working in the teenage pregnancy and adolescent health um, area. So I'm pretty excited about that. So, but we are here today to talk about infant and pregnancy loss. So my area, uh, my forte, uh, what I, my passion, what I love to do is speak to participants, uh, to speak to the community about what is going on in their lives, about the, the, um, the issues that happen. Um, you know, with their uh, reproductive health and, and child health. So that's what we have done here in, in the study on the lived experiences of perinatal loss. Um, so we can, we're conducting a photo voice study to understand infant mortality and pregnancy loss for women and birthing people of color. So um, we have heard this many times today, but it's the months of September and October for me because that is where we are celebrating, recognizing, memorializing infant mortality uh, and pregnancy loss. So uh, Lysandra has told us all about that, but September, October, and then specifically October 15th, where we're recognizing um, these issues. This is a poem from one of my participants that I think is, um, I would be remiss if I did not give voice to the babies who have gone on um, before us. And it says, little butterfly, I live my life inside of you, cocooned in all your love. So mama, papa, please don't cry. I'm still with you, just up above. I felt your every heartbeat. It's my sweetest melody. And for every heavenly bedtime, the angels play it back to me. I know how much that I'm wanted. I feel so very blessed. Of all the mommies in the world, I got the very best. You think of me in all your waking hours and on those sleepless nights, just look out the window and you'll find me, the brightest star, the most dazzling light. I'm that little breeze in the summer and I'm that unexpected white feather. I plucked it from my downy wings so that you remember we are always together. I know how much it hurts your soul when we had to say goodbye but I'm not gone, I'm always here. I'm your sweet little butterfly. So when we, all, when we conduct a study or when I conduct a study, I want to make sure that I am getting from the participants how do they define what's going on? How do they conceptualize it? So I ask them, like, how do you define this loss? How do you define what happened to you, the reason why you're here? So let's look at how the CDC, you know, and those um, governmental agencies define it first. They talk, they say that, and we've heard this before already, infant mortality is the death of an infant that occurs after birth and up to one year after giving birth. And then the CDC says that pregnancy loss are those deaths that occur before birth or during pregnancy and includes those miscarriages lost before 20 weeks and stillbirth lost at 20 weeks or after. And the WHO, they kind of, you know, give that same um, definition. Our study is very inclusive in that we also want participants that consider themselves birthing people, birthing people of color. So not just women, not people born um, uh, male and who have transgender. We want people who consider themselves birthing people, women and birthing people of color. 
color. So the National Institute for Children's Health, Health Equity defines a birthing person as someone who gives birth no matter what their gender identity may be, female, male, non-binary, or other. The purpose of this study, the purpose of this photo voice study is to understand infant and pregnancy loss experiences of this group, women and birthing people of color, from this intersectionality perspective. So intersectionality is those different uh, social uh, identities that they have, and we just want to see how those intertwine, those cultures, how they're linked to how they talk about it, how they cope with it, and in hopes that this will help to reduce the risk and disparities of infant mortality and pregnancy loss in the U.S. What is the problem? We've heard this before. The problem is that the U.S. US is ranked 36th out of 48 countries in infant mortality. Our infant mortality rate is 5.547. Dr. Sampson told us this in the United States per 1,000 live births. And again, we've heard that the racial disparities occurs in African Americans who have an IMR of 10.8 deaths. So Houston, United States of America, we have a problem. Our research questions for this study, what do we want to answer, what do we want to come out of this is, how do women and birthing people of color experience the, their loss, their infant and pregnancy loss? And the sub-questions are, how do they make meaning of their infant mortality and pregnancy loss experiences? So how do they understand it based on their prior beliefs and expectations and culture? And secondly, the second sub-research question is, what is the relationship between their identity, you know, who they are, you know, who they uh, believe themselves to be and their loss? And finally, how do these women and birthing people of color cope with their loss? So our procedures, the method that we used here is, um, well, first of all, how did we start the recruitment? We used convenience and snowball sampling primarily. Uh, we also uh, posted on um, Healthy Start's website, you know, their social media. Um, I also, I'm a member of a uh, communication association, so I sent out an email on there, but it was primarily convenience and snowball sampling, but you know, we still need more. Participants were asked to take two to three photos a day using the photo voice method, two to three photos a day for three days and send them to, from their cell phone to my email, my University of Houston email. So it's like an MMS procedure. And that is a way that we can validate you know, that we're getting information from someone's cell phone because if you just have email to email, to me, you know, that, that can um, set up where you get fake participants, and I, I definitely had that. Um, after the participants, after that third day when they send in their photo, they are scheduled for a photo voice interview where I ask them to choose two of their favorite photos, and I choose two of my favorite photos, and that is what we'll discuss. And, and with the photo voice method, there's a particular uh, mnemonic that you ask the questions in. You know, of course, it's... Uh, you know, it, it can vary based on how they respond. But there are particular questions that you ask to get them to talk about these photos. And then finally, once they're done, they're compensated with a $50 Amazon gift card. So the photo voice method, this was created by Wang and Burris in 1997. It is a feminist approach. It is a critical uh, thinking approach. It, it, the participants are considered as co-researchers where they're making meaning along with you as the researcher. And it is, it is a bottom-up approach, you know, where we're, we're finding out what they feel and then that's helping us to make conclusions. So it is a great method, um, you know, where we are putting the camera in their hands to tell us what is going on. They're giving like very loose prompts, you know, like tell me about the barriers and successes with your loss, how, you know, tell me, take a picture of how it is to live as a person who has experienced this loss. So we give them a lot of levity. Of course, I give like examples of photos, but I tell them like it is, you don't have to send these type of photos. It's whatever you want to send. Our demographics, so we're still in the preliminary stage. We still need 50 women. Um, we start, we only have five 
uh, women and birthing people. Right now we only have five women, but we still want 50 women and birthing people of color. So if you know anyone, please call Healthy Start, contact me. I'm gonna have my QR code at the end of this, but we really need them to talk about this so that we can help other mothers, other birthing people that are going through this experience. But as of today, we have five participants. Um, all but one of them is married. As you can see, we have a very highly educated group. Only one of them had some college. All of the rest were either college graduates or um, graduate school. Uh, you can see they make a lot of money. You know, their household income is very high. Uh, we have three African Americans, three black, one Asian, and one Latina. And as you can see, you know, I don't like to use this word. They didn't like to use this word, but we have those advanced maternal age participants here represented, which is the age of 35 to 44. The eligibility requirements where they must be a person of color, a birthing person, have at least one involuntary perinatal loss within the past four years. We chose that time period because we felt like it would be fresher in their minds. Uh, but I have a lot of friends who there was eight, they say, oh, I, I have a lot to say, but it was eight, 10 years. You know, so we needed it to be fresh in their minds. Have experienced this loss while living in the U.S., speaks English, have a computer or, um, you know, for the Wi-Fi, for the Zoom interviews, um, have a phone with photo taking cap capabilities, be able to email, of course, an adult. The only exclusion I t criteria other than, you know, the opposite of those things was they, if, if they revealed that they were currently pregnant, they were excluded from the study because we didn't want to have, you know, those additional mental health complications. You know, we didn't want them to have to go through that. Our data analysis, um, usually I use the frenetic iterative approach and that is where you just keep going back and looking at your themes and keep, um, you know, like revising them, but we're only in the first coding stage. So what you'll see here is, again, I can't make conclusions from five people, but I just have some observations that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but out of five participants, we have 42 photos submitted. They wanted to submit these photos. Uh, so the majority of them submitted more than was asked. You know, So three, four, five photos, they kept sending them. The interviews lasted an average of 52 minutes. And I'm telling you, it's something about taking the photos and talking about what they have in their phone that makes them willing to do this. One, one participant was saying that she just lost her baby, I think, what are we, is it, in July. And I, just, you know, and I know her, and I said, if it's too soon, just let me know. She was like, oh, for you, I'll do it. Her interview was the longest. You know, so it's something about starting with this talking and it's kind of cathartic you know, for the participants. So now let's get down to the nitty gritty. So our first general research question asks, what about their experiences? Like how do these women and birthing people of color experience this? They, their experiences were they talked about being hopeful, more informed, uh, self-appreciation. But on the negative side, they were mad at God. They felt blamed you know, for not being able to deliver a viable pregnancy, they felt ignored in the healthcare system, you know, why me and not others? They talked about how uh, I see these young girls out here engaging in risky behavior and they have healthy babies and I'm doing everything right and I, you know, my baby did not survive. So they had these kind of words, lack of racial congruence with doctors, not being able to find doctors of the same race was something else that they talked about. And so Ms. Chasina, age 25 to 34, a black mother who described her loss as loss of the baby or miscarriage says, but I look at, at God and my relationship, if he's supposed to be my father, think about my earthly father. If my dad and I had a disagreement about something, I would be able to talk to him or ask questions. And so I feel the same way when I talk to God. I told him that, you know, hey, I'm mad. I'm mad at you. You know, I, I, I don't know what is this, this is going on. I'm kind of upset with you. It don't mean I don't love you, but I'm upset with you right now. You know, so that's just an example of uh, one of those themes. Another participant talked about uh, self-appreciation. You can't see it at the top, but it was the self-appreciation theme where she said, I did a full moon meditation with a friend in the park and it was centered and allowed time for reflection, doing small things for me. The inner me is something I hold closer to my heart than ever before. I have to remember I'm more than just a mom, I am me. 
Miss Rashida, age 35 to 34. She, when I asked her to define her, she said she doesn't discuss it. She never mentioned it to the doctor. She never went to the doctor. Even currently, when she goes to the doctor, she never puts on her paperwork that she had a loss. So this is just the things that you know, uh, the, our participants are talking about here. We're not, when we're looking at meaning making, how do they understand this compared to their prior um, culture and, and beliefs? They, these, these participants have these diverse definitions, as you can see. Uh, they feel like some of their processes that they had to go through were financially driven, like they just wanted my money, sending me to all these doctors. They were remembering, memorializing, hopeful. They felt like this was a taboo subject, so they were silent on the matter. It was mentally challenging, but they also had time to offer recommendations to other mothers. So um, Miss Ramona, Latina, age 18 to 24, who described her loss as a miscarriage says, even though I know it is something that I can't control, I felt a lot of guilt. And then once I found out I was pregnant with her, I just, I just felt like I got in a purpose again to really you know, be on top of things, to gain freedom. I was also finding myself like showering more, consistently brushing my teeth, actually getting dressed for the day. So I feel like having her has in a way, like I know I'm her mom, but also it has helped me to find myself again, to find herself again, that's meaning making. When we talk about memorializing, this is one of the mothers who said, this is an eight, she's sending a photo with this caption. This is an eight pound teddy bear that I was given, that was given to me to use for comfort whenever I think of my baby, because her baby was eight pounds. I look, I took her out for a picture, but boxed her back up because I am not in a space to look at a bear of which should be my child. So that's Miss Elicia, a black mother, age 35 to 44, who described hers as an infant loss, as her angel. When we are looking at how these women identified, you know, how their identity related to their experiences, they felt like they were unhealthy. They were described, I, they were described in the healthcare system as geriatric. Uh, their cultural, they were in conflict with their cultural identity, wanting to break the norms of not telling uh, their current children about the loss of a, uh, of a, of a sibling. They want, because you know, like in some of the, especially in the black community, uh, we say like, that's grown folks business. You don't have to tell that baby, wait till that baby gets 20, 30 years old and then tell her. But these, these participants talked a lot about breaking those cultural barriers. Uh, the strong black woman, the superwoman schema, they talked about how they couldn't even grieve yet. Like, I don't have time to grieve. Like, I, I, I have a, that's probably why I can talk to you now. I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't even like processed it fully 100% myself. So um, Miss Alicia, the same one who had the, black, the, uh, the bear, the teddy bear, talked about, and a lot of times they tell us at 35 plus that we're really too old to be having kids. So that was my, that was the reason why and she was talking about getting a second opinion, because everything was advanced maternal. They used geriatric a lot, so I wanted to go to a younger doctor. I was looking for a black female that possibly dealt with any of this, but I went to a guy that really delivers only black women. So she didn't have that alternative of racial congruence with her healthcare provider. So her next alternative was, well, let me get a doctor who services black women, you know, majority of black women. Um, and this is also an example of misfortune when the participant talks about misfortune. So Miss Kaylee, Asian, age 35 to 44, who described her loss as a silent miscarriage, she says, as someone Chinese, I know of a custom that the year of your zodiac sign can be the most challenging. I am 36 this year, and it is the year of the rabbit. It makes me think of this miscarriage in context of a life challenge from the rabbit year. So these are just how these cultural um, tropes and practices also come into play. So just imagine if you were just interviewing someone without pictures, this may not come up. So that is why these pictures are so provoke, provocative, thought provoking, you know, critical because you allow them to look in their phones or look in their homes and send something that a normal interview may not bring forth. So when you look at how did these women cope, how are they coping with their loss? They use video blogs. 
Um, they read books. They, um, it was a lot of words about religion, spirituality. I'm blessed. Uh, you know, I, I, I've go, I'm going to church more now. They looked at podcasts and they talked a lot about family and social support, which is not surprising in communities of color. We have that La Familia, you know, that type of um, atmosphere. But uh, Miss Ramona, Latina, age 18 to, tw 18 to 24, who we, we um, heard from before, she said, ever since I can remember, I read to cope. When I miscarried and found out I was pregnant, I had conflicting feelings uh, of feeling guilty that I couldn't keep the other baby alive and happy the one I was currently carrying was growing well. I read to take my mind off of the situation and still continue to do so, especially with my mother's passing. If I let the thought spiral, I go to a very dark place. It is easier to get lost in someone else's story. And this participant chose not to share her photos, which is totally okay. You know, because we have that in our consent. Like, if you don't want your photos shared in presentation or in publications, you know, that's fine. But we still have her impactful words. When um, speaking about the family social support we just saw on the previous slide, uh, Ms. Chasina talked about family social support in this way. Well, it, is a, it was a very unexpected delivery, delivery as in this um, edible arrangements, but when it did arrive, it just let me know that my cousins wanted to express some way of their condolences outside of just the I'm sorry or the text messages or the phone calls because they knew in that moment I really wasn't ready for phone calls. So just a little sweet something because I'm a fruit lover. So they know that's something I really enjoy to kind of help with a little bit of happiness at the moment. So family social support is very important to these participants so far and I can imagine know that going forward, uh, that would be something, especially for their mental health. And these are just additional photos because this is photo voice. I just wanted to show you like how these um, mothers sent in these pictures like of, of the x-rays of their, their child's enlarged heart, of, of, of the podcast that they listened to, of a tattoo that they had to memorialize their child, of the books that they were reading, of um, how they cope mentally with exercise, walking in their neighborhoods, their experiences of going to the emergency room and telling them why they're there, but yet heart attacks and gunshots and all those other things come before them, you know, before them and their baby going to the back of the emergency room. So again, with five participants, it's not truly findings, it's, it's observations at this point. But these participants talked about the mistrust of the healthcare system, the reluctance in seeking mental health care. There were two of the participants who did not go to the doctor for their loss, like they never went. Um, Patient-centeredness, that we, the need for cultural, diverse, patient-centered care in the medical encounter, the stigma, the taboo of speaking about such a loss. Um, but these participants embraced their cultural identities. They embraced them, but if there was something negative, they fought to reverse that, you know, if it was not good for them at the time. And the policies, they talked about the financial policies and the ultrasounds, the need for more sonograms to, you know, maybe detect what is going on earlier in their pregnancies. And finally, oh, I, I went fast. Um, possible implications, again, with five participants, you can't really um, have, you know, it's, it, we, we still need more information. But these participants talked about, uh, well, I, I gather from their words that there should be more emphasis on preconception care, especially for the advanced maternal age mothers who, you know, want to um, have a child. Um, we hear about this all the time in the media, the insurance or financial incentives for seeking mental health care after a loss. So I feel like maybe some policies in the insurance, if it's private insurance, especially uh, that, you know, if they're giving some kind of money off, if they do seek mental health care after a loss. Um, the more liberal policies on the number of sonograms, um, because I know, I think it's two or if you're high risk, it may be more that are covered by insurance. Um, having patient-centered and culture-centered care uh, by mental health care providers, so that, that just involves either more training or uh, more recruitment to um, get people of color to uh, want to be in those careers. 
and the need for cohorts of sister circles of women um, to speak to other women and hear their stories about their loss. And I think Healthy Start does a great job of this, of getting their mothers together to talk about things, not necessarily a loss for Healthy Start, but just to talk about their experiences. And I think that, you know, that this would be a good thing to have for uh, women and birthing people of color who have experienced the loss. And um, there is my, uh, the QR code to contact me. Please, we need more participants. We only have five. We need 50 to tell their stories and to help other mothers and birthing people of color to uh, read about this when, when we publish this information. Are there any questions, comments, concerns? You know it's heavy. <laughs> In the back. Thank you. Right. Right. <laughs> mhm. And so I think it's a great idea to focus on mental health and, and kind of oh sorry. Um and kind of um you know th that needs to be reimbursed on all aspects and covid has taught us that if not anything Definitely. covid is a wake up call that mental health is very important here. Yes, so thank yes. You. Thank you for that. Um can you please can you get my QR code so that I can you can ask your patients if they would like to participate in yeah, this Yeah, I'm actually at U of H, so I'm, oh. I'm, I just started two weeks ago. I'm one of the new OBs there, so oh, okay. I'll definitely okay. reach out to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just some ways we can recruit better or something that in our, in our methods that we can do better next time or anything? You like it, you don't like it, it's heavy or yes? I just wondered if you've had any luck um, <laughs> I wondered if you've had any luck recruiting um, or forming partnerships with the FQHCs, like um, I'm thinking of Legacy uh, no. Community Health, which I think would likely have participants for you. Okay, I can send them. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Right here. Oh, sorry. And then her after that. Just want to say congratulations, Dr. York, on this. Hey! <laughs> um, uh, and. It's, I think, I just want to say that this kind of rich qualitative data that you get from these kind of studies is so important in the maternal health world especially mm -hmm. because it's so much, we get so much, like the way that you share that, the poems, like it was so moving and to understand like people's experiences that way I think motivates people a lot more. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes? Over here? Raise your hand up high. Oh, she has. Hi. Hi. Uh, I hope I don't get you in trouble. I don't know if you recognize me. I do. Uh, I'm actually Miss Ramona that participated in the photo voice study. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. No, you, if you um, say it, it's okay. I yeah. just can't say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I participated in the photo voice study, and I guess I, when you had mentioned it might be presented, I was nervous about my, you know, yeah. my name. My That's actual okay. name is Rachel. Okay. And of yeah. having my photo shared, um, yeah. just because you know that loss of control, it's but okay. to see that it's being presented in a room full of people um, who really care, and that there's a summit dedicated to loss, especially for women of color, mm -hmm. it means a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really happy with the presentation and how it came out. So yeah. thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I'm glad you came. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and sharing. <laughs> oh. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Another question is a thought. And if you know, if anyone wants some like um, feedback on how I do this, like please feel free to give me a call. Like I love this. This is my passion. Um, like this, these photos. Or I've done this for cardiovascular disease. Uh, my dissertation was on black maternal mortality. Like 
women send, even after the study, they still send me pictures. Like, here's the baby now. Like, it's something about it that helps them to release, too. So, you know, you're helping each other. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but that's, I have to take a deep breath. I think we deserve a break after this. What do you guys think? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break and we'll come back here like maybe 10, 15.
Thank you for agreeing. <laughs> Welcome back. Our next session will be hosted by our CAN director, Latasha Perry, will be question and answering. And I believe the panelists will, Tasha will facilitate um, this portion and have the panelists introduce themselves. Latasha Perry, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, I just wanted to, um, I'll do my like little spiel about who I am and what I do for Healthy Start a little bit later, um, but we wanted to come back and have a discussion with um, some individuals who are in the community actually doing some work, right? Um, this whole um, summit is around infant mortality and, and solutions to that. Um, so we have um, a panelist of um, a licensed professional counselor, a doula, a lived experience expert, a pediatrician, and a NICU advocate. And I am not going to introduce them, I'm going to have them introduce themselves because I feel like our journeys are our own and our stories are our own. Um, and so I think that that's best um, said and described by the individual who has lived through it. Um, so the, what I'm going to just start and ask my first question and then just allow you guys to introduce yourselves that way. So my first question for you all is, um, can you share with myself and the audience um, who you are and um, just what led you be, to become involved in infant, um, addressing infant mortality and or what inspired you to come and share your story today? Um, so we can start with Dr. Yuragi. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Yiragi. Um, I'm a general pediatrician, assistant professor at uh, UT Health Houston McGovern Medical School. Um, I uh, primarily see uh, babies and uh, kids until 18 years of age. Um, I am um, also um, chair of child nutrition, breastfeeding. I'm passionate about breastfeeding and nutrition for kids. Um, I'm also um, director of um, advocacy track for residents at uh, UT Health Houston. Um, I um, kind of, um, since um, I came into residency and I've been involved in taking care of kids, um, my uh, passion is to prevent um, childhood injuries. Um, it's uh, more, uh, as a pediatrician, uh, we have been uh, talking to parents and counseling them about anticipatory guidance and measures to prevent these injuries from happening. As we all know, um, counseling and talking to parents about what steps they can take to prevent these injuries is very crucial because most of the time kids are engaged in activities which are not required or appropriate for their age groups and sometimes parents are not aware about how to keep the environment safe. So talking to them, counseling to parents is my passion and uh, help to keep these kids protected and for a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davis? Yes, hi everyone, I am Adriana Davis. I am the founder and executive director of the Harmony Grace Foundation. What led me to this uh, maternal health um, um, being an advocate is because of my own personal experience. I gave birth to a 23 week baby girl, Harmony Grace, um, who later succumbed at seven months to her illness. Uh, we spent seven months in the NICU getting different um, things about her, uh, her health 
being a first time mom, I did not know what questions to ask, what uh, concerns to raise. So my daughter uh, going through all of this, me not knowing a whole lot and me not having anyone to turn to is what led me to begin advocating for NICU families. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Catrice. I'm a local midwife with the home birth practice here in Houston. I was a doula for many years and then expanded that scope a few years ago to uh, embrace midwifery. I realized when I was invited to do a radio a talk show about 10 years ago surrounding the topic of infant mortality rates, infant morbidity, and also maternal mortality and morbidity that it wasn't really something I'd paid attention to. So even doing birth work for several years prior to that, uh, I had blinders on, which you know was an embarrassing thing to have to admit. So in just wanting to see those, those changes, to see the numbers, change, the numbers drop, hopefully one day disappear. That's kind of been the drive. So now I also have the privilege of mentoring doulas in the, uh, the UH Healthy Start program here in Houston as well. Thank you. Dr. Cooper? Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Karen Cooper, a licensed professional counselor, board approved supervisor. Um, what inspired me to get into maternal mental health? Many moons ago, I worked with the Healthy Start program when it was still under the umbrella of neighborhood centers. And I didn't know much about the program when I started working there, but as I started working and started to hear the stats about like infant and maternal mortality, especially in Houston Harris County, the first thing that came to my mind is why? Like why in where we have one of the largest medical centers and one of the largest metropolitan cities, why are moms and babies dying? And then taking it from a mental health aspect, I know we talk about like diets and all of those things, but to me it was like it has to be more. And so then doing my own research for my dissertation and knowing about depression and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, again, why? Why is this not being addressed? And so just kind of me wanting to be a change agent on my small stage, being able to do that. And as um, similar to Ms. Davis in 2020, experiencing my own traumatic birth experience, giving birth to my son at 23 weeks and two days. And during COVID, we know that we were all isolated and all of those things. But even in a hospital, day one, social worker came in, I appreciate her, gave me all this information. I'm still in shock, I'm still in trauma. And after that, nothing. Me as a therapist going through my own mental health challenges, I was like, you know what? There's a disconnect, there's something missing. And so now it's become my passion and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Johnson. I am, I guess I was a um, mentee of um, Miss Elaine at Healthy Start. Um, I had a traumatic birth experience because my daughter was also premature and I'm also a first time mother. Um, so I thought that was really the main reason why I'm really here because of that experience and how much it changed me. And, um, how much I felt like I wasn't really listened to or really I didn't understand much. So just like she said down there, really the experience that I had um, in the hospital during my birthing process, um, as well as um, afterwards about how I felt and who I could ask questions to because um, I was um, or I am the only child um, with my siblings that has a child. So it's kind of like they didn't really know how to assist me with that. So I'm really just here for experience and um, how Healthy Start really helped me during that whole entire birthing process as well as my entire pregnancy. Thank you. And so we talked about or heard about earlier when Dr. York was speaking and we heard about it just here during their introductions on the panel um, in regards to support. Um, and so my next question, um, and I'll start with you, Ms. Davis. Um, can you tell me, um, what your um, thoughts or ideas are around advocacy, um, what, that, what that means to you, what that feels like, what that looks like. Um, can you give us a little bit um, from your perspective? Yes, advocacy is actively supporting um, a cause or an idea. Um, I feel when you advocate for someone, you're letting them know that you do care. Um, you're raising awareness. Um, when I became, or after I became a NICU mom, I knew in nothing about the NICU, I knew nothing about maternal health and all of that until I became a part of that, that, that type of um, outcome. So being that I never heard about it, I wanted to begin t telling my story because what I did learn is I was silent for so long and being silent, I know that I wasn't helping anybody yet alone, I wasn't helping myself. 
So then when I became comfortable sharing my story, I realized how many women I was encouraging and supporting and allowing them to be able to tell their story. One thing that I, I learned from it is you never know what your story and who your story can help. So advocating for them is uh, actively supporting them and I definitely wanna continue to support these families and know that they are not alone, that they can always share their story because it's gonna help someone else. Thank you. And Jasmine, you spoke a little bit about support as well. Can you tell me um, if you felt supported by anyone or what if you did not, um, what advocacy would have looked like for you? Um, I think I joined Healthy Start initially because um, I was at a concert and it said something about like birthing and it was just like a flyer. Um, and of course, like I said, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I'm a first time mom still and I still don't know what I'm doing, but <laughs> Um, I can say like when I actually joined and they set me up with a caseworker and a um, at home nurse or I don't know what to call it but with Miss Kim they set me up with a nurse um, that came to me because I was high risk so the information that they gave me was stuff that I didn't know that I didn't really ask questions because I didn't know what to ask when I got there I probably went to maybe one appointment with my mom and that was probably the first appointment. After that, I didn't really know what to ask. So I would always ask them like, is this supposed to be correct? Or if they would tell me something, because I already had prenatal diabetes, I had all these issues every single time I went to the hospital. So I was like, is this correct? Am I supposed to be doing this? So Nurse Kim would kind of reassure me of questions that I didn't ask while I was there, because I didn't know what to ask until after I left. Mm -hmm. And so I would ask her like, is this right? They're telling me I should do this or that. And actually, um, I had my baby at 33 weeks and five days. That fourth day, I was actually in Denver. And I flew back to Houston because I was um, experiencing a lot of swelling. I was just really out of breath already. And I was already supposed to go see my um, specialist like on a fifth day. And so I saw Nurse Kim and she was like, you need to go to the hospital right now. And I was like, are you sure? Like, I mean, I've been swelling the whole time. I've been <laughs> out of breath the whole time. Like, this is normal for me. And she was like, no, you need to go. But we were already doing check-ins, and I had already called her, like, that full week that I was already um, back in Denver, back home. And she said, okay, once you get here, I actually had my appointment already set with her to come. And she came that same day that I actually got back to Houston um, and told me to go to the hospital um, right away. And I went right away. And, of course, um, I had my C-section the very next day. So I think just being able to, cause I would have honestly sat at home still, stayed home and just put my feet up and I would have just went through it. But I think um, having them there for me and actually telling me what I should do and having her um, offer or Healthy Start in general offer those services um, and hear out what I, the questions that I had because I didn't know what to ask at all times um, in real time, I think that really helped me because once I got to the hospital, it was a different experience, I'll say, um, well, experience that I don't want to have again. And I think before when I joined Healthy Start, they didn't quite have the doulies, doula services or um, only the nursing services that came to the home. So I was like, oh, I missed that um, time frame to have that because I did want to have that for someone to come in and really coach me through what I was supposed to do. Um, so I can say in real time that really helped me as far as any questions that I had. Um, I could text them or call them at any time. They would even check up on me. So I think as far as advocacy and having someone there for you, especially as a first time mom, um, that really helped me, especially because my baby was in the NICU. My baby was premature and I didn't know what to do. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yuragi, hearing these comments, um, can you talk to, some, um, talk to us a little bit about um, creating a safe environment? Like, what does that look like for you when you're working with your patients? Absolutely, great question. Um, so, um, one of the important uh, cause of um, infant mortality is also sudden infant death syndrome and um, unintentional injuries. So, keeping a baby um, in a safe environment is most crucial um, and there are many measures um, that can be taken to prevent this so counseling parents about safety measures is important during all well child check whenever you see a baby in the clinic it's important to convey the message to how to keep the baby safe um, 
most important with back to sleep campaign a kid should be always sleeping in the crib that's the most important thing so every time checking with parents whether there is a crib available in the house or a bassinet available so that the kid, the kid can be baby can be in a safe place back to sleep um, the kid should be always sleeping back not in the prone position always in the supine position making sure there are no other objects in the crib no pillows no soft toys no other objects not even crib bumpers should be present to prevent the risk of suffocation or sudden infant deaths um, in addition to that it's also um, another important uh, factor um, that can reduce SIDS is uh, breastfeeding so it's also important to advocate for breastfeeding as a mother of two and having done uh, breastfeeding exclusively for a year for both my babies I know what the challenges are uh, for breastfeeding and also um, how you can support moms, nursing mothers with all the resources. As a pediatrician, um, being aware of these resources is great, but also you need to take your that time during the visit to convey these resources to families, to these mothers, uh, because there are definitely challenges which can be overcome and can lead to a successful breastfeeding period for up to a year even. As like myself, um, a breastfeeding mother during my residency years and training, it was not easy. And many a times I have seen moms asking me, I'm going to back to work. How can I breastfeed my child? It's definitely difficult, but it's not impossible. I have done it and I personally talk to my, pa my patients, my um, moms, nursing mothers, talk to them about how it can be done. It's definitely keeping in mind the duration of the visit when we see the patient in the clinic. It's kind of hard, but it's important to convey this to prevent all, uh, in, uh, preventing this um, sudden infant death because breastfeeding has a positive impact. It definitely has shown to cause decrease in number of incidences of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome in babies. Um, as a faculty at UT Health, it's not just me talking to parents but also kind of sending this message to my medical students, to my residents, to convey it to their patients as well. So it's not just one me talking to them, but a chain of persons talking to their patients and spreading the message. Thank you. And so making sure that you're passing that education down mm -hmm. so that they can have those conversations with parents as well. I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Harris, can I ask you the same question? When you're working with um, patients as a midwife, doula services, things like that, or even as a mentor, um, when you're looking at like racial disparities within individuals, like how do you create that um, supportive environment when working with patients in the community? Sure, I think it's really important to realize that a lot of the disparities we see are because of conditions that have just been passed down from generation to generation, it's really challenging to reach a mom after she's had a baby to make changes, to convince her to breastfeed, if maybe for uh, emotional or psychological reasons that's not comfortable, or to, to teach new skills if her mother or her grandmother um, isn't supportive or didn't have the same options that she now has. So in short, I think it's really, really important to start with educating families, we have to start with educating the communities. Honestly, the ones who probably need to hear our message today are probably not in the room. We need insurance companies to make more things available. The doctor mentioned those moms need cribs and baby beds and bassinets to prevent sudden infant death syndrome, but if they don't have the financial means to get it, how can they? Um, Medicaid doesn't often welcome the provisions that are needed to prevent these problems from happening. We have three beautiful moms on the panel who experience premature births. Mm -hmm. Maybe something could have been done prior to their pregnancies or, or even more attention, um, not to jump on another soapbox, but systemic racism is, is hugely at the root of this. And there have been studies done in so many countries. There's a study in Boston that stated the general population of the medical community is finally realizing what so many have been living for years, and that's that to, to be of certain nationalities and races in the United States is in itself a risk factor. So we need to educate, we need to um, come together as a community and, and just make those necessary changes long before our moms get pregnant and have babies. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dr. Cooper, do you have a response to that question? 
Mm -hmm. Sure, and so just taking the mental health aspect of it, and so like Dr. Uragi and Ms. Harris said, a lot of it comes with educating and like allowing me to educate my moms on what does postpartum depression look like? What does postpartum anxiety look like? Are you paying attention to the baby? Or are you so tired and overworked and depressed that you're not able to see like, okay, is the baby placed on their back? Is the baby in a safe environment? And so it's really educating them on how to notice the sign themselves, but then also building that support network of who can we identify if you are overwhelmed who can come over and help? Could it be a doula, a postpartum doula? Could it be a family member? And so again, just educating them on the mental health aspects of it. Thank you. And so I, I guess I want to ask too, because we talked about, you know, like education and, and how important it is. Um, do you feel like you have the capacity within your fields that you're in right now to provide that type of education? Like what steps are you taking yourselves to kind of reduce um, the disparities as it relates to infant mortality and maternal morbidity? Dr. Yuraki? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so um, definitely we have been seeing uh, those disparities and as uh, we heard prior and during the presentation, health equity is more important, not just equality. Uh, it's important to provide those resources um, to the families and then we can have everybody at the same level. Um, so um, as a pediatrician, um, in my, uh, when I see patients, we do screen everybody for social determinants of health, making sure everybody has good access to food, um, they have access to um, insurance, they are eligible for facilities. As um, parent, like they get uh, facilities for week, they can be eligible for weeks from where they can get um, food, baby foods, formulas, moms can get their vitamins and uh, all the help they can uh, during the first four years of life. Um, but are those uh, resources available to them? We also screen moms for uh, transportation because first year of life, vaccines, every kid needs their vaccines on time. But are these parents able to bring their child to the clinic? That's most important. So screening these um, kids for social determinants of health and providing this, uh, the resources available. So we do, after screening, if we find any of the um, kids have any of the difference, like the parent cannot bring the kid to the clinic, they have transportation problems or they have food insecurity, we do have social workers then di redirecting them and providing those resources and clinics. Uh, definitely, the, one of the challenges sometimes you can have families who don't come up, even if the questionnaires are given, sometimes they don't feel um, like, should I talk about this? Should I not? The resist, like the hesitancy in um, talking to the provider. It's kind of developing also. One of the important skills is to build up a rapport with your uh, patients and your families so that they open up and then uh, we can overcome the challenge together. Thank you. And building that rapport that you just spoke about is an, an extremely important to kind of create that safe environment for people to open up. Um, so I appreciate you, you, you mentioning that. Um, other responses to that question? And I can ask the question again. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who, at, who said it earlier, but I know, well, I'm a high school teacher um, at Yes Prep, and I know they partner with Legacy. So I know someone mentioned earlier, maybe that is a good idea to do that because they do do a lot of programs within um, the Legacy Community um, Clinic. So I think that is a good thing because we have them placed right inside of our schools. So placing um, resources right where you can meet the client right inside the schools. Thank you. Other responses? Can you repeat the question? Again? Yep. Um, so whether in your professional capacity or in a per, um, personal capacity, um, what steps are you taking to contribute towards reducing infant mortality? And again, for me, I know like when it's working with clients, teaching that advocacy piece, like Ms. Davis stated, like being first time mom, sometimes you don't know like what questions to ask. And so going through my own lived experiences and through trainings, a lot of the works that I do with moms um, and women is teaching like what questions do you feel comfortable? I know that women and moms can feel insecure of going in and questioning this service or what that's for, but again, always reminding them like you are the consumer, like they are there to provide you a service and it's you asking and pretty much advocating for the services that you need. And so it's just really trying to educate and doing that. And then also me participating in panels and summits and discussions such as this to give some of my, my, my clients voices about what they're experiencing and what we may need to do to kind of help reduce some of those racial disparities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to make safe space for those who are currently going through some challenges and, and trying circumstances so that they're comfortable 
um, opening up and comfortable then receiving information and recognizing that their care should not be in a box, but their care should be individualized. So uh, personally, I, I try to do that with the women I work with, our visits. Sometimes I wish they could be 30 minutes, but we have two hour long prenatal visits just because sometimes it helps to just talk and uh, work through unpacking those layers that are holding women back and holding individuals back from having better outcomes. So I would just encourage any who are in the capacity to do so to simply hold space for those who need it. And, and that's I think is a good first step in making some changes happen. Thank you. And I would, um, not to sound redundant, but definitely advocacy, but what I would add is partnership and collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that one organization isn't going to get it done. So with the Harmony Grace Foundation, we have partnered with, um, oh my gosh, it just escapes me, um, Little Angels Network and um, Missing Peace. And um, knowing that all of our organizations align, we are collaborating together to continue to advocate for the things that we've gone through for me, uh, being a NICU, uh, former NICU mom, and for their organization is pregnancy loss. So it's that collaboration piece. And as Ms. Cooper said, it's being on panels like this, uh, advocating, speaking, allowing others to have a voice who feel like they can't have a voice. Thank you. And so I just heard collaboration. I heard education. Um, I heard advocacy. Um, are there other strategies that you all are using or that you would like to see being used in order to effectively um, reduce racial disparities um, other than the ones that were just mentioned? Is, what, are the ones that we're missing or ones that you're currently using? I think like Ms. Harris said earlier, like having those round tables with those who actually make policies and things of that nature, trying to get in the door with like insurance companies to allow them to know like what we see in the, the work that we do, like really giving them that firsthand experience and acknowledgement because it's great for us to do this, but then if we try to take it there, then what? So I think trying mm -hmm. to find a way to where, again, we can have those kind of round tables with insurance companies, the, the legislators and all the powers that be to really start to make an effective change. Thank you. Yes, that is important. Yeah, I second that. That's really important uh, because uh, even like as a, uh, a pediatrician, the time that we get uh, to be with a patient is kind of 20 minutes visit for a full physical. Uh, so which includes like talking to parent, gathering history, performing physical exam, and counseling parents about it. And counseling is, it, I mean, there is no time limit. You can take 10 minutes to even sometimes half an hour to counsel parents, depending upon how they are doing. So uh, just merely 20 minutes visit is not giving justice to that part of the total health of a baby. Um, I mean, the counseling can go from just how to make a formula to crib safety, car shift safety, and everything as per the age of the child. Um, I have seen even parents like talking about formula, um, even dilution of formula can also contribute to um, electrolyte changes and can cause infant mortality. Mm -hmm. So is that crucial thing, just talking to parents which is going to prevent these things from happening. So I wish the visit was more. Thank you. Others? So now I'm going to ask a big question, right? Because we talked about, um, and Ms. Harris, I'm actually really interested to hear your response because I, I feel like you're going to have a good one to this question. Um, we talked, you know, like about and leading into this whole summit is in regards to solutions, right? And so, like, if you had a magic wand, um, if you had your perfect wish, um, what would you say would be your strategy leading towards or that would help um, the reduction of um, infant mortality as it relates to racial disparities? What would you like to see? I think it, it really boils down to finances. I think it comes down to insurance companies. Um, if I can share one of the stats I brought, and I'm, I'm going to read this one verbatim so that I don't get it wrong. Uh, there's an organization that was founded in 1918 called the Commonwealth Fund, and their goal is to promote high-performing equitable health care systems basically worldwide. 
Uh, there, they stated there are clear opportunities to put the U.S. on par with other countries, keeping in mind that the U.S. is third worldwide in well maternal mortality, which trickles down to infant mortality. We're 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 third. We're behind other underdeveloped countries. Um, strategies would include free or affordable primary health care. The United States is also the only country that doesn't have um, what we call a universal health care plan. So I. And with that, with, with the fact that Medicaid can't take everyone or that everyone then can't afford insurance and there's a huge gap, that gap leaves about 8 million women of reproductive age uninsured. So I, in addition to you know, my call for education, I think education is huge, but we also need, we need the funds, we need the opportunity from insurance companies and Medicaid to make the necessary changes so women can get the services and support that they need. Thank you. Dr. Yuragi, same question. If you were given a magic wand and unlimited resources, right, not an option, what would you say would have the greatest impact as to addressing um, racial disparities um, for infant mortality? I think I would wish to bring health equity, uh, providing the resources first to all our uh, communities which are requiring it, um, bringing them at par uh, and having everybody equal, uh, providing equal resources um, to everybody so that uh, every kid would get a right to better health and better future. Thank you. Ms. Davis? Um, the three that I listed is, uh, of course, access to quality education, community engagement, and nutrition and food security. Those are what I listed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cooper? Um, I was thinking like being able to increase representation in like the medical, the health fields or non-medical fields. I know for as a, a mental health therapist who specializes in maternal mental health, a lot of the comments that I hear from my clients who are women of color <laughs> is like, Dr. C, you're like a unicorn. Like I don't find a lot of black women who specialize in that. And so trying to find <laughs> ways to create more, again, variety of physicians, clinicians, therapists, and things of that nature. Increase funding, because I know that's one determinant when you choose like your, your career field and doing those things. But I just think definitely increasing more representation um, across the board. Thank you. And Ms. Johnson. Um, I would say representation as well, because um, I think sometimes even when you're picking a person of color, um, do they still represent you? And that is kind of like, um, did I go to the right person um, for me? Do they understand my story or the questions that I ask and they don't get offended or they don't just brush me off? So I think in a perfect world, do you have that representation um, when you're finding a physician? Because you may think that is a person of color, but they're still just here. Like she said, with that 20 minute time frame, you gotta go. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big part. Thank you. And I, I guess as you mentioned that, it, it brings up another question for me in regards to barriers. Um, and so when you are looking for the right physician, the right mental health provider, um, the right midwife, um, doula services or community services, um, what would you all say are some barriers that you have seen um, for um, women of color to access um, those um, those representations and, and, and adequate health care and things like that in the community? The biggest one I would say is just the financial piece. Because um, again, just using myself as an example, one of the first questions, do you accept insurance? Because if not, then I can't afford this particular service. And so for me, I think it's just financial. And then also too, because of some of their experiences of maybe picking a, a physician and then going to that physician, even if they are a person of color, not being heard, not being listened to, so that becomes a barrier because now they're not wanting or trusting the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And so that's us navigating through that as well. Thank you. To provide a, a equal representation or increase the representation for uh, people of uh, color, um, it's also important to give access to education to everybody, um, uh, provide them with equal number of opportunity or maybe more opportunities, more funding uh, for a better um, education and better life. Thank you. Others? 
education has come up a lot during this conversation. And so when we're looking at educating our participants, when we're looking at educating our patients, um, where is that edu like where is the breakdown? Um, what are we missing as far as who provides that education? Where is that coming from? Um, is it coming from yourselves as professionals? Um, are you seeking that as a, 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 a patient of, of your um, mental health or, or health care provider? Um, what are we what are we looking for when we when we're mentioning education? Um, I think back to my own experience and my my daughters are we'll just say older right now we <laughs> won't give actual ages. Um, I had a pretty average uh, job upbringing was married uh, you know I, I, I was pretty average. But my doctor never mentioned childbirth education. It didn't cross my mind that I needed childbirth education. When I went into labor, I showed up because that's what I was supposed to do. So I, th I think it starts with perhaps the providers um, explaining that these options are there. And then again, childbirth education is not free, whether you're getting it from the hospital or whether you're getting it from a private source. And while I think any and all of us would like to provide free resources at every turn, it's, it's just not feasible, just not possible. So I, I think it goes right back to insurance. Um, with many of the classes I teach, some insurance companies will cover it. Uh, they'll cover breastfeeding, but not childbirth education. They'll cover doula support, but not midwifery care. So there are just so many gaps, so many disparities. And um, yeah, I, I, I think it really comes down, as, as Dr. Cooper said, to, to money. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I can say um, that I searched or looked for a lot of places that offer different services. So um, even like with, just with Healthy Start alone, just seeing that on the screen, that's something that I think I need. I'm going to text or I'm going to clip on the UR, QR code. Um, any service or anything I could find that was free, there was not a lot. and it was like a time limit on a lot of things, like you have until tomorrow because we only have two more spots available. Um, that was a big thing um, on some of the programs that I wasn't able to get in or um, give them all of the information before the deadline. So I think I kind of sought out those places or sought out different programs because I did not have that education through my uh, PCP or through my OBGYN, so I actually looked those places up like literally Googled them and went from there. Thank you. And I think like Ms. Harris said, like just finding a way to where it's the physicians or the hospitals or those offices really trying to put together a resource, being able to expand Healthy Start. Like I said, when I started working from them many moons ago, I was so excited because it's a wraparound service. And even here and now, you know, with the addition of like the nurse and the, the um, doula services, like that's a truly a one-stop shop. And so like it's not the moms having to go here for a mental health clinician, here for a doula, here for this. Like it's a one-stop shop to where they can get all the education and stuff like that. So definitely finding more funding to where they can expand their services. Definitely continue to form those collaborations and partnerships with physicians' offices who come across women like, hey, here's this resource, here's that list of resources. So like Jasmine was sharing, she doesn't have to get on Google to go because that can become overwhelming mm -hmm. after a while. And it's like, you know what, never mind, I'll figure it out. So just trying to just enhance all of those resources that are there, but definitely bridging a gap from whether, again, it's the physician's office or community place to whether the women and the families can access those resources. And I would say that I'm not a healthcare professional, but with the experience and knowledge that I do have is sharing what I know with them. And then as Ms. Cooper said, if we do have resources that we can hand off to them, we can do, do it that way as well. Thank you. And then just my last question here is in regards to stigmas. We heard about it in Dr. York's um, presentation. Um, we talked about you know like representation here on this panel. Um, what are some ways that we can kind of reach the community to kind of break down the stigma, the stigma of, you know, like, I don't need mental health, or, um, you know, like, this can't happen to me, or, you know, like, as it relates to SIDS or, 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 or premature um, births and things of that nature, um, how do we address the community as it relates to stigmas? Again, for me, from the mental health aspect, normalizing it. 
Like everybody cries, everybody's happy, everybody feels sad, everybody's anxious, and so it's doing a, a lot of that normalizing and letting them know. And especially with the, the superwoman syndrome, when Dr. York mentioned that, I felt that in my bones because I remember going through it with my, my son's experience. They're like, oh, Karen, you're a superwoman. Do not put that label on me. I don't want that pressure in my life. I am not a superwoman. And I think, again, just normalizing and reminding women and families you can cry, you can feel overwhelmed, you cannot like your kid in one minute and still be a good mother. And so I think just going to them and letting them know like you are having a human experience. It doesn't mean that you're less than, it doesn't mean that you're a bad parent. And so that's a lot of work that I do, just normalizing the experience. It, it affects everybody, mm -hmm. you know, especially when it comes to mental health, there's not one single color, race, ethnicity that affects, it affects us all. So for me, it's definitely just normalizing that experience. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you get that experience, Miss um, Harris, when it comes to doulas or, or, or having a midwife that you know, like people are kind of turned off or how do you really explain yourself as far as the benefits of having your services? When you asked that question, that word normalized was the first word that came to mind. And, and, and yes, there are stigmas out there that you have to have one or the other that you can't seek holistic health care with a doula, or if you look for a midwife, you're turning your back on medication, but collaborative care is really, really important. Maybe we have a mom who desires a different model of, of, of medical care. Maybe she wants a home birth, maybe she doesn't, maybe she's still searching. But if we had an opportunity for, for OBs and uh, midwives to work closer together, and not just in, I think, three hospitals in Houston, maybe four, um, if we could expand that, then I, I think that would, would also kind of, kind of bridge a gap and, and not make it seem so stigmatized that you have to choose one or the other. Thank you. And I know I asked a lot of questions, but I just wanted to open it up for you all if you had any lasting comments that you wanted to say to the audience. May I share some stats? Just one minute. Mm -hmm. okay. I apologize. But I just think it's really, really important that um, we understand that it doesn't matter what a person's um, economic background, their socioeconomic status is. Um, a lot of the problems that we see are just overreaching us as human beings, but even at a deeper level, it's just a fact that black families in the United States have, um, have, have worse outcomes, and the, the numbers are not getting better. So we could go back to 2018, and if we took 100,000 women, um, just looking at maternal mortality, 14.9 or 15, women who are non-Hispanic white would die, 12 Hispanic women would die, 37 black women would die. In 2019, that number rose to 18 white women, 12.6 or 13 Hispanic women, and 44 black women. In 2020, that rose to 19 white women, 18 Hispanic women, and 55 black women. So everyone's being affected, but systemic racism really has a huge impact. We have the most modern medical advances probably in the United States, right here in Houston, but our numbers are getting worse year after year after year. So I, I would just implore anyone who knows anyone who has any reach at all to really pay attention to whatever we're doing is not working, and we really have to change that if we want to change the numbers and save women and babies. And to follow back on what Ms. Harris just said, like I, you know, everyone is here today because they have an interest or a desire or maybe a passion to try to help reduce infant, you know, mortality. And so I would just challenge everyone in the room, if you could just be a change agent by just offering support, meaning if you're not an OBGYN, if you're not a pediatrician, if you're not a mental health clinician, but you come across someone or you come across a community to where you know like there's a need or something like that, just providing support. That could be a listening ear. That could be like, hey, I went to this great summit. I heard about this program called Healthy Start. You know, it's being able to try to help bridge some of that gap. So being a change agent that way. Thank you. I appreciate you all being here. Before I let you go, I do want to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so as a clinician, I feel like I would like to tell everybody, talking is most important. Please, please, please do talk to your patients. Um, the more you talk, you build a rapport. 
uh, and they get, get, they feel supported and they try to come up with whatever concerns they have. If you don't talk, I know the time is limited, but you have to um, make patient families feel that you hear them, you uh, make them, like, we'll provide them uh, support and resources. Just mere being a clinician, restricting to a clinical space is not important, but getting out into the community, building community partnership is also important. It's also uh, important to not only take, um, uh, uh, I mean, not only important to take care of your patient's health, but also mental well-being for not only the patient, but also their families. Mm -hmm. And that's how we'll build up a healthy um, um, future for everyone here. Thank you. So before I dismiss you, I do want to open it up for anyone in the audience who may have a question or a comment for anyone on the panel. Y'all ready to eat? Oh, okay. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> That's all. Hi. Oh, I was wondering, like, if y'all didn't have the circumstances that you did to lead you to have the professions that you have now, do you think that you would have ended up in healthcare or somewhere else? That's a good question, and I'm going to say no. I am going to say no. Um, one, because I, I, it, it never happened, and, but to me, it never happened to anyone in my family. And um, when I became cognizant and knowledgeable of uh, health care and, and, and um, premature birth, I said, oh my goodness, this is a major issue. And it, when I went through my own experience, I knew how serious it was. So to answer your question, if I had not gone through it, I probably wouldn't. But because I've experienced it, this is where my passion lies now. Thank you for the question. Did anybody else on the panel want to answer that question as well? Jasmine? Well, um, I'll piggyback on what Ms. Davis said as well. I would not have been here, most likely, if I wasn't pregnant. Um, I also am a premature baby. My, um, the baby my mom had before me, um, she had a miscarriage as well. So. Um, it wasn't until I actually got pregnant that I was like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? I was actually able to see it for myself and experience it. But other than that, I was really just like, oh, you have your baby, you go to the hospital, you're all right afterwards. It wasn't anything in between there at all. The education piece was not there. So I would just say experience is everything, like I tell my students. So that's it. Thank you. I would say real quick, real quickly for me, like yes, I would have still been a mental health clinician, but I think it wasn't again until I started working from Healthy Start some years ago to where I started to switch my focus to maternal mental health. So yes, I've always wanted to help people, but again, when I got to a Healthy Start and that big question of why it came about, that caused me to shift to maternal mental health. Other questions? I did see. Hi, good morning. Felicia Peterson from UT Health, um, OBGN nurse case manager. Just wanted to say I'm so grateful for this panel, for this um, forum on today. Um, I'm here with my team, and we are advocates for the patient, and there are so many takeaways uh, we will be able to take from this forum today. Um, to help to do a little bit more um, to, for the cause, to reduce infant mortality. Um, the other thing, and I'm passionate because I was a neonatal nurse before I started working for OBGYN for the last four or five years now, being the case manager. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is so important to listen to the patients. That's something that I'm finding. Um, I can, Carolyn, being the social worker, can talk to a patient. Marcini can talk to the same patient in the same day, and then I can talk to a patient. And we all, it, it depends on how the patient relates to which person. Mm -hmm. You can find out so, so much. Uh, you're able to help that patient. And daily when I go to work across the street, um, I'm there to say, who can I help today? 
that's my comment and thank you so much. Thank you, Felicia. We have a question over here. I'll ask it quickly. Um, I'm at Center for Houston's Future, which is a sort of research branch of the Chamber of Commerce, Greater Houston Partnership. And so we tend to look at things at more of an economic and employer lens. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, you asked the magic uh, wand question about education and insurance. I'm wondering if there's anything specific that employers could be doing to better support maternal health and black maternal health. Good question, thank you. As it relates to employers, I think it goes back to earlier when we were talking about like Medicaid extending like the leave for 12 months. Um, sometimes with some of the clients that I encounter, it's the pressure of like, oh my gosh, I just had my baby, now three months I'm having to return to work. What is that gonna look like? Sometimes, thankfully, they have like the supportive work environment to where it's like, you know what, take it back easy as you transition back into it. But then sometimes moms are like, here you go, here's all the work that you missed. And so maybe by employers within extending some of that maternal leave per se, not just forcing moms to go back into the, the thick of things, but still allowing them that grace period to kind of transition back into it. I think that can definitely create like that supportive environment. So I'm not on the panel, but I'm up here with the mic, so I'm gonna answer that question. <laughs> um, I think that my comment would be um, creating a space for, um, and Dr. Yuragi um, um, lended to it a little bit earlier, um, is um, a mothering space. Um, you know, like going back and having a space to breastfeed, um, having um, an opportunity to take that 15 minute break or to have that be the norm, um, to say like this is a space for, for you to kind of just like go away, close the door, um, no questions, acts um, and then a, a place to store that breast milk as well um, because breastfeeding is important um, and not a lot of employers allow that space um, for you know like whether or not you're in the bathroom or you know like you're looking you got a cubicle and you know like how do you work out those those nuances and so having something like that I, I feel like would be greatly beneficial for employers to look at thank you all again oh. for being here oh I'm sorry Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, um, my name is Julie Edwards. I'm a health science educator with my students here at high school. Um, I, my, I keep going, obviously, you know, we're all here with different passions and I definitely am passionate about women's health, especially at this age. Um, and in my brain, just as I approach to motherhood, like you've mentioned, so much of what we bring into motherhood is what we've learned and seen practice in our households. And I think you're so entrenched in whatever that is, good or bad. It's like you said, sort of hard to change within pregnancy. I guess my question would be for these future mothers, you know, what can we do better at that age, you know, to start preparing people for motherhood, equipping them to be those patients that will ask those questions. I mean, it's something I'm passionate about in my program. I tell them I want to create good consumers of healthcare, whether or not you go into it or not. You will be a patient. You will advocate for somebody. Um, but I would like to know what we can do better as, as women approach those ages where they are having children so that they are ready um, in the best way we can to equip them. I'd like to say I think it's um, definitely not medical, but it's so emotional, so mental. It's um, it's em it's empowering. I mean, you've got a group of beautiful young ladies at your table, and for them to feel that they are important and they're worthy, and to understand that they'll be birthing the next generation, possibly of leaders. Um, we need, I think, to encourage healthy relationships, healthy lifestyles. It it just it's so not medical, just empowering young people to be their best selves and then that kind of evolves and has a domino effect into making better choices as we grow older. Okay. Dr. York, I know you had a question but I kind of want to piggyback off of the question that you asked um, because I know that we have a panel of, of, of females and, and you mentioned to your um, regarding your classroom but I also want to um, talk about and, and bring um, highlight to the males that may be involved and the females that are giving birth um, and what that looks like um, in terms of supporting women um, whether or not they are in the process of a, a healthy pregnancy or in the duration of a loss um, or as it relates to mental health um, from a loss um, or just going through the process of helping a woman through that pregnancy. Um, any comments in regards to that? 
I think you just said it best, like just, and also Ms. Harris too, of just having like that healthy relationship. Cause I think with the healthy relationship, like that healthy support just kind of comes naturally with it. And so like, you know, for the men and audience, like just being able to provide that support, sometimes that support is just sitting there, allowing like that space to hold space for it. Like, especially if there's a pregnancy loss, sometimes you may not know what to say or what to do, but just sitting there and being able to provide that space. And to answer the original question as well, as well as Ms. Harris stated too, I think really encouraging the young women to create their own self identity. So even if you are brought up in a, a certain lived experience, allowing them to understand that doesn't have to be your experience as you become an adult or a mother or anything like that. And so it's really you identifying how do you wanna show up in the world as someone who can give birth to the next generation. And I think that can set a good foundation for them moving forward. I second responses? everything they said, but what I like to touch on is including the men. Um, what, what I will say is during my experience, um, Harmony Grace's father was right there with me. And it was all, it, every, all the questions were directed to me, but it wasn't just about me. It was about her father too, because he is also going through it as well. So thank you for including the men. But like they said, having a healthy relationship self-identity and all of that is gonna help you when you get to that point. And I'll also say this, um, within those relationships, um, I feel like sometimes you have family members that are so accustomed to what you've already done. Um, so when you do something else, like I'll just say breastfeeding for example, and you're sitting here breastfeeding and they say something like, um, how long are you gonna do that for? Like they didn't do it before you, but you can kind of be that educator in between. Like I'm doing this, this is also what I've learned. Um, this is why I've been successful. So I'll say that to just put my personal thing on it because I have finally stopped breastfeeding after 20 months. So I will say I did get those comments from just like my parents or even my peers that didn't know about breastfeeding until I actually started to do it um, and was successful at it. So sometimes you have to be your own advocate to say like, well, this is what I actually got. This is the information, and this is how well I've been doing. Thank you. As and a pediatrician, I want to add another thing regarding breastfeeding is um, it should be a collaboration. It should be a team effort from uh, pediatricians as well as OB team. Um, it, because um, after a baby is born, it's kind of too many things to process for this mom getting to know how to breastfeed and um, how to, I mean, what are the challenges and talking to mom at that time is kind of difficult for her to absorb everything, whatever is being talked. But kind of talking about breastfeeding during the uh, last few weeks of pregnancy or maybe during third trimester, introducing parents about, about breastfeeding, talking to them the importance of breastfeeding and how can it be done, the challenges and how to overcome those kind of give this mother time to think about it and make an informed decision and kind of overcome those challenges rather than giving all the information after a baby is born when they have like two days in the hospital or a day even if the baby is born term every every mom like i have breastfed my baby it was not easy it is difficult for sure but it's not impossible you can definitely overcome those challenges and can do successful breastfeeding Thank you. Dr. York. Okay, um, this question is for Ms. Harris. Um, there's this comparison to um, the baby is the candy and the mother is the candy wrapper. So I heard you say that you went from a doula to a midwife. So were there times when you thought about, you know, like now I'm not for the mother, the midwife is usually for the, the baby, am I correct? That's a loaded question. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll share with you what one of my mentors told me when I first started doing doula work. Um, we were talking and she asked why I wanted to do this, why I liked it, and I said, I just love babies. You know, babies are so sweet and we just have to take care of the babies. And she said, no, you need to, to love women before you can do this work. So even uh, as, as a doula, it's so important to see that the, the rapper, as you put it, is, is, is huge. If we don't have healthy moms, we won't have healthy babies. And for me, the uh, transition from doula into midwifery care um, was, was just expanding the scope of what I was doing. Doulas are hugely important. Doulas will support families, whether they're seeing an OB in the hospital, midwife in the hospital, or midwife at a, a, 
out of hospital experience, and doulas provide a level of care, I think that helps the mom to feel empowered, if I can use that word again. Family members often rescue, whereas you have that doula support that encourages you as an individual, but lets you know, yes, I can sympathize and offer you support and allow you to be vulnerable. Midwives do that to an extent as well. It's hard to, to break free from that, but I think midwifery care goes a little bit further in ensuring the safety of both mom and baby, but we, we definitely have to make sure we're still supporting, advocating, and caring for that mom. Thank you. And then we'll take our final question. Hi, my name is Adrienne Miller. I'm a second year in the full-time MBA program right across the courtyard from here. Um, my question for you all is really just um, of kind of a fact-finding or um, question. I'm wondering if there's any businesses that you all have seen that really stand out as doing a great job of supporting mothers in their businesses as well as creating a better infrastructure for business to understand how to best support mothers. Like any, just any companies that you're like, they are really getting it right. They're helping to push forward this work in a really compelling way. <clears throat> Healthy start. Sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really good question. Um, I don't know if it was because she'd been there for longer or if that was just the policy, but she had like six to s I, I, like six to eight months off at home and here in Houston. So I was like, whoa, I wish I had that. <laughs> Deloitte, yeah. My brother had, my brother, her husband had like a month off or something, I feel like. Or it was my husband didn't have anything off, so the fact that he had something off, I was very jealous. So, I just wanted to mention really quickly. I think Alicia Lee might be here, but she worked to. Um, she, she just not, did. She step out. Yeah, she worked to um, bring a program to Houston called Best Place for Working Families, and so there's a designation, a website you can look up that lists all the companies who are doing a really good job supporting moms and families. Um, I work along with the Women's Resource Center of Greater Houston, and um, it's a business run, well, nonprofit run by women. Um, I only work with women, um, and they're very flexible, so that is an option for moms. Um, everyone there has, pretty much everyone there has kids. I have two kids, and I am in part time with them, and about I would say 50%, if not more, of my job is remote from home. Um, the only part of my job, which is facilitating in high schools um, to teach financial courses, is about three hours in office there at the campus. Outside of that, I'm doing meetings and P, like professional development every now and again. Um, and that oftentimes is on Zoom as well. So. That's a really good option, and they're very flexible. When I had my, they hired me while, I would not say heavily pregnant, but definitely <laughs> um, five months pregnant um, with my second child, already having a toddler. Um, I brought my toddler into the office soon after um, hiring, and that's after I had already worked with a nonprofit that uh, said it would be okay to have my toddler there. This was run by a man. Um, and uh, soon after my toddler was there, he was like, I don't know if it's working out. Um, so, and then I was also pregnant, which he also knew, and then um, transitioned from that nonprofit to another nonprofit, which is the Greater, uh, the Women's Resource of Greater Houston, who has since made it a breeze and has supported me um, not only getting back into the school and the program when I was ready to do that, um, according to just having had a baby in January. <laughs> um, and uh, ever since, they've just been super helpful and flexible with like clocking in and out, um, making things as easy for me as possible. So I would definitely recommend the Women's Resource if you wanted to do something part-time. They're also hiring full-time positions um, coming soon. So 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so I know it's time for lunch, but we're going to have one more question, and I promise I'm not eyeing none of y'all else in the, because y'all not going to be looking at me talking about I'm hungry. So <laughs> we're going to have one more question from the audience. I apologize, everyone. This should be a quick question. So my name is Aletha Johnson. I'm also a health science teacher from Channel View High School. And uh, this is more of just a question that I've always wondered. Um, is there like a breakdown for, uh, I guess, specifically towards maternal mortality between um, moms who receive Medicaid and middle income families? Maybe they have their own insurance through their employer. I'm just wondering because from my experience, it's just been like these high deductibles. A lot of, even my coworkers are like, well, I'm not going to the doctor because my deductible is extremely high or they just kind of put their health care on the back. Whereas if you have the Medicaid um, or other programs for low income families, it's like, it's a lot of resources out there. So just wondering if there's some type of relation between like, you know, the differences between the uh, availability of income and just the uh, underinsured, because just because you have insurance, you're still, you can still be underinsured. So just wondering if there's information out there about that. Dr. Sampson in the audience would like to answer that question. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so research in general shows that women with private insurance are having better outcomes and they're staying longer in continuity of care because what's happening on the Medicaid side um, and anybody in here who is on Medicaid or has received Medicaid, you know that it takes a while to get enrolled in Medicaid. So what we see is a lot of people aren't actually able to access those services until late second trimester, sometimes even third. And not having early entry into prenatal care is absolutely, absolutely one of the predictors of negative outcomes. I think also one thing that is, um, you know, elephant in the room that has to always be talked about with maternal mortality is we also know that regardless of age, income, education, black women are still dying at three times the rate. So when we look at, we looked at a local federally qualified health centers data trying to see what difference does insurance make, what difference does the timing make, what difference does it make for them to go in and out with different providers. There actually wasn't much of a difference between the types of insurance. And at that FQHC, it was Hope Clinic here, at that FQHC there was uh, private insurance, there was Medicaid, there was CHIP, there was also, I'm forgetting the name of it, but a specific type of insurance for people who are immigrants and they don't qualify. Um, so comparing, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't remember. CHIP perinatal. So uh, comparing all of those, the differences weren't across insurance as much, which kind of surprised us too. But the people who stayed with the same clinic, like it really helps what Ms. Harris was talking about is this idea of collaborative care and integrated care. So that when I go and I'm pregnant, no matter which trimester, I'm welcomed in, even if I'm identified as high risk, because there's also something that happens everywhere, but it definitely happens in the local community where a clinic might not want to take somebody who's super high risk late in pregnancy, right? Because for various reasons. So you come into the clinic, you're assigned your OB, but you're also arm's reach within mental health resources. And then after you have the baby, you can come back to the clinic and see your OB and see your pediatrician in the same clinic. And we're calling that continuity of care. There's um, some variation in language in the research. But what we see is with people who stay with continuity of care, they're more likely to receive specialized care. They're more likely to have early intervention. The mental health issues are identified earlier. So to, as a long-winded way of answering your question, is that so far, it depends on how you look at the data. Sometimes it appears that private insurance is doing better, but really it's kind of the devil is in the details there. And it's really about how soon you get in and the quality of relationship you have with your provider as well, there are just so many different factors. 
but ultimately it would be fantastic to see um, a quicker on-ramp for Medicaid. Uh, that's something that I'll be advocating for in my role here at Baker is a quicker on-ramp to Medicaid so that people can access that sooner. It does help. Thank you. And so I just want to give a round of applause to our panelists here. Um, it takes Thank you. I know, oh, I know it's time to eat lunch, but real quick, I, I kept sitting here and I don't, it keeps bothering me, but I, I guess I need to say this. It's going back to the stigma question. I would encourage um, you guys to go and see somebody. Um, one of the things that troubled me is um, it was black people would be crazy if you go and see somebody, right? And when I was going through my situation, I allowed that to affect me and I became very depressed. Well, after talking to my mom and she said, you need to go to a therapist and I went and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So for some reason it kept plaguing my mind the entire time while I'm sitting here. So I encourage you to go and see somebody, especially black people, uh, because that's that stigma that they put on us that um, you all will be crazy or you know something is wrong with you and nothing is wrong with you. You are going to help yourself to continue to be your better version of yourself. So that's all I have. Thank you, and don't apologize. I believe in being <laughs> obedient, and that message might have touched somebody in this room who needed to hear that, so I appreciate you speaking up and saying that. Um, and I also appreciate you all taking your time to come and, and share your stories and your journeys with us um, and answering your questions. It takes a lot to talk about this topic, so I appreciate you all's time. Thank you. Um, <laughs> We have a wonderful spread of buffet um, feasting, so I would encourage you all to um, go and help yourselves, and we will be back um, in 45 minutes for the rest of our discussion.